Let's take this opportunity of soaking up as much information as we can that he will share with us during the course of his presentation. We encourage you to get to know Adrian. He is a veritable treasure of information and knowledge. And this visit from Lycoming is very short. It's one day only and we need to make the most of the time that we have. Adrian is the Lycoming International Manager of Asia, Pacific, Middle East and Africa. I might add that he's an ardent rugby fan and a staunch supporter of the All Blacks. If you see Adrian, he's either wearing a Lycoming shirt or an All Black shirt. He confesses though that he only supports two teams, the All Blacks and anyone who's playing Australia. Adrian entered the aviation industry in 1974 and has been with Lycoming for 29 years. He's a licensed aeronautical engineer holding CAA, CASA and EASA licenses with global experience and particular expertise in the Asia Pacific China region. Some of the highlights of his time with Lycoming since 1985 are introducing the first Lycoming engine into China in 1986. Since then, he's delivered over a thousand Lycoming engines into China. He's developed and expanded Lycoming's global reach into his region and developed OEM programs in the region with GIPS, PAC and AMF. He has successfully grown Lycoming's aftermarket business across his regions. He is now the old guy at Lycoming to whom we all turn for advice. Adrian, master of the Lycoming universe, loyal supporter of Absolute, and has always been there for us. Thank you very much. We welcome you, Adrian, and thank you for sharing some of your knowledge with us today. Good evening and welcome to an evening with Lycoming. Um, we did actually have sound with this and we were going to make it all nice and fancy, but it's, uh, it's obviously it's turned to custard. So welcome back to Africa. Even lions and tigers ran away when they heard that I was coming. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, introducing Pete Schreiner. Well, that's Pete on the, on the left, and uh, I guess the guy on the other side in the, well, in the middle is no stranger. Um, Pete Schreiner um, is our Director of International Sales. Um, Pete's also um, has been involved in aviation for a number of years. And you might recognise the name, particularly if you have anything to do with Hartzell. So Pete was Vice President of Hartzell's product support uh, for their engine technology products. And we sort of stole them away to bolster and to build our, um, our business uh, globally. Um, I'm no stranger. Most of you have met me. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the things that are uh, probably uh, you're most interested in. Um, Pre-COVID, wow, what can we say? You know, that changed the whole world. COVID did change the world. It changed the world for everybody and it changed the world for Lycoming. Um, there were some rather unique things that happened during COVID. Corporate decided that, like everything else, circle the wagons, cut your supply chain and hunker down for the storm which we did. The only problem was no one had told our customer base. So while we'd cut our supply chain and, and circled the wagons, the orders didn't stop coming in. In fact, the orders increased. And during COVID, we actually experienced somewhere close to a 27.5% increase in business. So to cope with that meant that we had to re-look at how we had our supply chain we couldn't get our supply chain 100% back together and we did our best to produce engines and parts. Okay. After COVID, the orders still kept coming and we found ourselves in a situation where we were totally overwhelmed at every corner that we looked at. We had spare shortages, we had cylinder shortages and we had engine delivery shortages. No matter what we did, the orders kept coming. And unfortunately, even today, we are still struggling to meet our customers' commitments. 
We are making progress. Our spares have improved remarkably in the last three to four months. We have invested millions of dollars in new equipment and we are establishing a second production manufacturing line for cylinders and some parts. So we've actually doubled our production capacity okay? and we are barely keeping our heads above water. Okay? But we are committed to getting that sorted. Okay? Expansion is important. Um, we have a couple of challenges within Lycoming. We have an ageing workforce. Okay? We have machinery that has reached end of life. So corporate have allowed us to invest very heavily in new technology and new equipment. We struggle to attract people to our industry, as do a lot of other companies. It was rather interesting that earlier this week I attend, attended a national aviation conference back in New Zealand and two companies that presented at that, com uh, that conference was, one was Pratt & Whitney Canada and the other was uh, Textron Aviation. And after the Pratt & Whitney Canada presentation I came away from that feeling quite happy about it because their situation was not only as bad as ours, but in my opinion was actually probably worse. So at least we are making some progress. Okay. And the same for Textron Aviation, they have major challenges as well. And of those users that use their product, you're probably fully aware of that. I'm going to start off with our usual care and maintenance. I want to introduce some new product. I want to update on a couple of crucial or pretty important service instructions and then I will open the floor to questions and answers. The last time I put the slide up, South Africa won the World Cup. So I'm just giving you some hope. Right? <laughs> For those that are directly connected to our engine from a business point of view um, or commercial and are servicing and maintaining engines, the one thing that I want you to remember is lycoming.com. Okay. If you go to the lycoming.com website and you click on technical publications, this thing should have a light on it somewhere, but um, you'll see right at the top, technical publications, you'll find all our publications free online. Um, you'll find all our service, and service bulletins. You'll find all our service instructions, service letters. You'll find our operator's manuals. Okay. You'll find our maintenance manuals, you'll find all our parts catalogues, and they are free. You can also subscribe for free for any updates to any of those publications. So that is a free service that Lycoming offers. Okay. There is also a lot of other information on tips, how to care for your engine, how to uh, maintain your engine. So I strongly support www.lycoming.com. Um, updates to service, and service bulletins and service instructions. The two that I've picked out at the moment that are probably most relevant um, and probably one of them that's probably the least understood is service bulletin 480F. Okay, so I'm now dealing with the people that maintain your aircraft or if you do maintain yourself. So 480F is the revised procedures for oil change, but also um, has um, data to help aid you in the event that you find metal contamination or debris during your filter inspection. This has been expanded and is quite a comprehensive document when it comes to being able to identify the material that you find in your engine. Okay? It also gives you instructions on what to do if you find metal in your engine and you have concerns because you can actually contact Lycoming directly and ask for assistance in that analysis. Okay? So it's quite, a, quite an important uh, document. So if you've got nothing to do on a, on a rainy Sunday night in South Africa, have a look at Service Bulletin 480F. 
Okay, most of your maintainers should be familiar with that document. Okay, so it's pretty important that you understand that document. Okay, service instruction one zero zero nine has a number of impending changes, and whilst this document has not yet been released, it is very close to release. Um, there are three important things that will change in that document. 1009, there will be a revision to the aerobatic TBO. There will also be a revision to the agricultural TBO. Okay. Um, also, there was a revision to aircraft involved in frequent use. So those are the three major changes that is coming up in the next revision of that service instruction. So I want to go through some reliability update. Uh, and this is something that we probably haven't done for a while. And it just gives you an idea of how we monitor what's happening in the field. And this is just a snapshot of probably the five major things that, that we get reported. So we keep an analysis or we keep collecting data from operators we collect data from OEMs, we collect data from distributors, we collect data from field shops, okay? And that database goes through a, uh, what we call a QIP, quality improvement process, where we analyze to identify what are the major unscheduled maintenance items, what are the major unscheduled cost items, because we're all very sensitive to cost. Okay. So this is a quick snapshot of what we're looking at. And this is looked at probably every week at the factory. So we are monitoring um, this data uh, very, very carefully. Um, <clears throat> some of you have experienced some of these issues and they have been logged. Okay. So engine failures are very rare statistically. Okay. There's probably less than one in a million hours when it comes to total engine failure. Okay. So our current trends is that we have a number of oil leaks. We have continually, we still see sticky valves. We see some low compression issues. And we have at the top of the range, continual magneto ignition issues okay so we use a lot of technology we use a lot of buzzwords um, you probably all have heard about six sigma and you're probably sick of six sigma for those that uh, that deal with it but we still use those tools in our analysis okay so when we get a Pareto chart we look at what is having the most impact and what is having the most cost impact on your operations Okay, so we look at these and we say, right, crankshaft seals, what's happening with that trend? It's trending down. We've also identified some internal issues in the factory and made corrections. And I've had the pleasure of working with a number of people here in South Africa to deal with a particular oil leak case. We've also made some internal process changes. So we are, we are deliberately looking at these to work out how we can make the engine better, how we can reduce cost, how we can reduce the maintenance cost. Sticky valves, um, for those that operate helicopters, this has always been an issue. It's also very strongly related to the way the helicopter is operated and cooled down after flight. Okay? A lot of private owners with, with private helicopters need some lessons in how to cool down their engines, which will prevent sticking valves. Low compression has uh, trended down. We had an issue where we had valve seats not aligning. We had valves that weren't, weren't quite sealing the way that they were supposed to. We also saw some distortion um, and we have worked to improve those issues. If you're a helicopter operator Rob, using a Robinson R22 and R44, we have introduced a new rotator intake valve to prevent um, erosion or burning of the intake valve. 
The one that sort of sticks out at the moment is that magneto maintenance and magneto unscheduled maintenance is still a major reason for reduced reliability of our engines. It's also probably the single largest cost to an operator is due to magneto uh, unreliability. Um, seal leaks, um, we found an issue with the silk thread that we were using. Silk thread is actually a vegetable, it's made by moths, okay, and we have updated our um, procedures. In the field we use Loctite 515, which most of you that are in the engine business will be familiar with. So uh, front seals, that is trended down, okay, and we have introduced in the latest edition of 1324C a Permatex um, adhesive that we have tested and have had really good results with. So if you get a chance, look at the Permatex Optimum, Optimax um, 27037. It's globally available. I've checked, it's available here in Johannesburg. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's, that's available uh, global. And one of the things I think we had, and I've noticed in the 30 odd years I've been with Lycoming, that a lot of the products that we we list in our bulletins, and Tony will agree, um, you can get them in the US but nowhere else in the world. Okay, 98% of them are hazmat, so by the time you buy a $16.39 tube of sealant and you ship it all the way to South Africa, it's probably cost you $150. So we are moving to a point where we want to use sealants that are globally and readily available all over the world. Thing with sticky valves, the emphasis is on engine cool down. If you come in with a hot engine um, and you shut it down straight away and you've got CHTs above 300 degrees, the oil will boil between the guide and the valve and it will coke up and that coke will reduce the clearance to a point where the valve actually seizes in the guide. More prevalent on helicopter operations, particularly um, Robinson uh, 22s, 44s, and those that have got Schweitzer 300s. So the emphasis on that is to ensure that you have a engine cool down regime. The difference with a helicopter, it comes in, it lands at nearly 98% power, so it's red hot. Okay. And most of the issues that we find on helicopters is because there's been insufficient cool down after landing and shutdown. Service instruction 1280D also advises of a change and the installation of the rotator intake valve on the parallel valve cylinder. Okay, we don't seem to have as many issues on the on the big AE1A5 angle valve engine, but. We do have issues on the R44 with the parallel, via, parallel valve F1B5 engine. So far this has actually proved to be pretty good and since we've started to introduce that we have trended down on the number of incidents of, of intake valve burning. So it's working. Low compression, as I said we had some valve seating issues at the factory. We have now made corrections to that. We also found that the outsourced cylinders that we were being supplied with, we seemed to have a higher rate of low compression incidents because of valve to guide or seat to guide misalignment. And those in the engine business have probably seen those as well. Okay. Cylinder manufacturer is now totally in-house at Lycoming. And with that being in-house means that we have a stronger and a more comprehensive quality control system in place in the manufacture of a cylinder. In the manufacture of a cylinder, just have a guess at how many operations there are to produce a cylinder. Anybody want to have a guess? How many operations, how many individual machining processes is there required to manufacture a cylinder? 250. <coughs> Okay. So it's quite a complex piece. It looks simple, but 
It's got a lot of processes that go into manufacturing that. So if you get one process wrong, then the cylinder is not going to work. It's going to, you're going to have a fault. Okay, so it probably is the single most issue that receives the most amount of, of inspection and quality and um, performance control in the manufacture process. Okay, so as a result of that, we have a lot better QA. We have invested a significant capital uh, expenditure in installing CNC machining centres. We have machines that, four machines would fill this hangar, just manufacturing cylinders. Okay. So as a result of our new cylinders and our in-house uh, quality control problems, leakage trends are going down. So that's good news. So there's a lot of work going on in that field. So magnetos. How many people have had a magneto die on them? A few hands, isn't there? Yeah. How many people are sick of having to send their mags in for a 500 hour inspection? How many people have had a coronary when they got the bill after that 500 hour inspection? Okay. And then you find that the thing fails anyway. Okay. So we have taken this on board because that's the largest single cost to operators. Okay, and that affects Lycoming's like engine, it affects our reputation. So we've done a lot of work in coming up with a new solution. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, lions and tigers, I'm very happy to present our new electronic ignition system. This is a totally contained, self, well it's not actually self-exciting, but solid state ignition system. This is what was fitted to your car in 1975. We're catching up. <laughs> At least it works. Yes, you did right, Barry. It works. Okay. It is a bolt-on replacement for your magneto. Okay. It comes with a lot of features and I'll go through those features. Um, and you know what the good news is? There's no 500 hour inspections anymore. Everybody's thinking and looking at this and thinking, well, how much is this gonna cost? What I can tell you is that this is priced at the same price of what you would pay for a new Slick Champion Magneto. So we've maintained the same price break. But the advantage is you're not shelling out every 500 hours for an inspection. So this is, yep, it's, no, no. It is built to our specification, okay? And I'll go through that. The EIS is approved for all twin magneto um, engines, okay? The EIS is, is, has been added to all our FAA type certificate data sheets, okay? It's already in service. We have probably several hundred of these in service globally. Um, and all I can say is that I don't get any phone calls. So it's working. I have personally installed a number of these units for customer aircraft. And um, the result of those have been um, absolutely outstanding. And two of those customers are actually regular uh, public transport. They're flying 30 minutes over water, some of the roughest ocean in the world, and they're running EIS, okay? Um, most of the data that you require for installation of the EIS module is contained in service instruction 1569B, okay? Um, we do have a couple of little glitches. Nothing's ever quite where we want it when we bring it out of the box. No, it's not broken. <laughs> it feels like it's broken, right? <laughs> it's, meant to, it's meant to feel like that. Okay. Um, because it's electronic, it requires power. Okay. It is not self-generating like a magneto, and it requires uh, power from the ship's uh, bus, whether it be 12 or 24 uh, bus. Okay. 
Under the FAA type certificate and certification process, we can fit one unit to an aircraft as a minor modification. Okay. The moment we fit twin systems or dual EIS, then we are required by the regulations to either have a dual bus or twin alternator um, system in the, in the electrical system or a backup battery. Most of the new Cessnas and in particular the Cirrus, the SR20 Cirrus, uh, uh, I think it's the G6 model, already have backup battery systems and we are working with those manufacturers to be able to link directly into the existing dual bus systems in those aircraft. So they become relatively easy candidates to, in which to install EIS. The other thing that Lycoming is very close to receiving is that we have made application to the FAA for a generic STC. So that generic STC will allow you to install the dual system on all the aircraft that are listed in that STC. Um, one of the first manufacturers to come out with a service bulletin for installation into the airframe was actually Gippsland Aeronautics for the Airvan. So the Airvan actually has a service bulletin, an OEM service bulletin that allows you to install the EIS system. We ran into a wee glitch with the airvan because a lot of the airvans will use a Hall Effect switch to run their Garmin or their TACO systems. And one of the things that we forgot about on the EIS that we don't actually have a TACO output on it yet. So we have come up with an interface box that will actually provide that signal to Garmin, Avidynes and JPI systems. As you'll note, there are some rather interesting fittings and features on this. There is a built-in timing light. So there's no more trying to put leads on and have the leads fall off and find that the timing light battery's gone flat. All you need to do is you can either connect ship's power to the timing terminal or go downtown and get yourself a nine volt ever ready battery. This unit will run on nine volts. If we could get a TSO for a nine volt battery, then life would be really simple. The unit also has the availability or the ability to have variable timing. Currently the variable timing is switched off. It's approved, but we need to do some more work in the mapping of the engine performance um, spreadsheet or, or 3D model that is embedded into the unit. If you turn the unit over on the drive side, you'll see a little silver plug. Okay, and under that plug, which is sealed, is where we load all the secrets to this unit. So we're actually able to update the firmware at a later date if we, when we switch on the variable timing. The unit has the standard P-lead terminal that bolts straight into your um, electrical system. Um, the timing light, when you're timing this to the engine and for the engineers and technicians, that you time this at top dead center. Once you've timed it at top dead center and you've connected the power to the system, it is there for the life of the engine till the engine reaches TBO. There is no intermediate maintenance, there is no 100 hour inspection required, and there certainly is no 500 hour inspection required. The unit fits the existing Champion Slick harness cup. So you don't have to change your harness, the harness will bolt straight into the cup. I'm pretty excited about it and, and I'll tell you what, um, I put a couple of units on an engine just recently and, and I think the whole job took me less than half an hour. Basically what we're trying to do is eliminate ignition system maintenance, that's the bottom line. We want to eliminate that 500 hour inspection, we want to eliminate the unscheduled maintenance costs and all of you probably at some stage outside of the 500 hour life have had a magneto fall over you're either stranded in the middle of nowhere 
um, and Australia and South Africa share a very similar geography and when you're 1500 miles from nowhere and you get a magneto go down and you're stuck in the middle of nowhere um, yeah what do you do so we're trying to eliminate that from the thing so we've ended up with a unit that's basically solid state there's no moving parts and we're pretty happy with it so far we've come a long way we looked at experimental units. There's some names there that you'll be familiar with, with Lightspeed, EMAG, PMAG, ElectroAir. We went and looked at all those units, okay? And we looked at what the advantages were and the pros and cons of the different systems. And then eventually we settled on a system that was basically met our basic design standards. We then took that unit and took it to the next level. The unit is based on a design from a company called Surefly, okay? And if you go online, you can buy a Surefly system that looks almost identical to the Lycoming EIS system. The difference is, is that in our design, we went through and we tested it and we made a number of changes to the, the structure and also the resilience of the unit. We beefed up the bearings. We beefed up the drive shaft, and that drive shaft actually all it does is it triggers a Hall effect switch internally, okay? And that's what you'll notice that when you actually turn that thing around, there's no resistance because there's nothing else on it except a couple of bearings. We then took the, the unit and we tested it for a couple of thousand hours to make sure that it was going to be resilient and meet our requirement to be able to fit it and run to TBO. The weight and balance is the same, so there's no change. The unit runs from 9 to 32 volts. We've basically got one, one unit will fit all voltage systems. In standby mode, it draws 0 0.005 milliamps. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And at rated power, it draws 250 milliamps. I mean, that's nothing. I mean, that's, it really is nothing, yeah. We use a 10 amp fuse. I don't know why we actually put a 10 amp fuse when it's only drawing 250 milliamps, but that's the way it is, yep. And it uses the standard P connection on the engine. As far as its size is concerned, it's pretty much identical to the magneto that it's replacing. Slightly different mounting, but does the job. Um, typical electrical circuit for the electricians and the avionics people in the room, they will fully understand where we're coming from. Um, and this shows what we do with a single unit and what we can do with the dual system and the backup battery. What's interesting is that we have been working with a company called TCW, and TCW manufacture a backup battery, and this backup battery is what we call a pass-through battery, so you can connect the EIS directly to the pass-through battery, which is then connected to the bus. And the pass-through battery has the function that when it senses a power loss from the main bus, it automatically switches in the power supply to the EIS. Completely seamless, no switches, no relays, nothing. Power loss, bang. The backup battery is in, is in play. And as part of our planned type certificate, or sorry, supplementary type certificate, is actually a, uh, based around the TCW battery system. Uh, the TC battery system is used on a lot of other applications um, where people have done avionics upgrades with Garmin's and Avidyne's and it seems to be the battery of choice. The backup battery under the regulations must be able to supply power for a minimum of 60 minutes and when we've got to draw 250 milliamps um, it's, it's well and truly within that, within that uh, envelope.